All right, well, welcome to lecture three, the action potential of myocytes. There's a little bit of information about how you can use this lecture if you want. And this is uh, part of a nine part series that covers all of electrophysiology. So this will be the third lecture. We're gonna talk about myocytes and exactly how they depolarize. So here's some priming questions for you, questions that by the end of this lecture, you should be able to answer. First one is what's meant by the resting membrane potential. Then I'm going to ask you to label this diagram using those terms, those four terms. Also would like you to label that diagram using the numbers zero to four. And then I'd like you to describe in detail how ions move around in each of those uh, four different or five different uh, phases of depolarization. And the last question for you is, What's a potassium rectifier channel? What does that thing do? What I want to start with first is resting membrane potential. So if you've got a cell, you've got the inside of the cell and you've got the outside of the cell. And usually there's a difference in charge between the inside compared to the outside. Normally, as we've said, I think before in this series, the inside of cells are negative and the outside of myocytes are positive in relation to each other. So what we've drawn here, and you'll see this used everywhere in electrophysiology, is uh, xy axis. And on the y axis here, we've got voltage measured in millivolts. And this is comparing the voltage of the inside of the cell compared to the outside of the cell. So when we're right at zero, we've got an equal external and internal charges. The charge outside the cell is the same as the inside of the cell. When cells are resting, they, they're described as being polarized and the inside is much more negative than the outside, on average about 90 millivolts negative compared to the outside. So minus 90 is where the inside of cardiac cells normally rest compared to the environment outside them. When we hyperpolarize a cell, it can bump up to about positive 20. So the inside of the cell briefly becomes more positive than the outside, but then settles back down. So be aware of what a resting membrane potential is. It's the comparison of the inside charge of the cell to the outside of the cell. We're measuring from inside the cell. And normally, cells are polarized at around minus 90. So the inside of cells are around minus 90. I want to talk about depolarization of cardiac cells, but first I want to talk about the depolarization of neurons because neurons are a lot easier. And usually by the time people have come to cardiology, they've already studied the action potential of neurons. So this is a bit of a review. We have our cells sitting. And if you remember from before, we said that calcium and sodium sit on the outside. Potassium tends to sit on the inside. They're all positively charged ions. There's more uh, positively charged ions on the outside, the sodium and the calcium. There's just potassium on the inside, so it tends to be more positive on the outside, more negative on the inside. When a neuron is just sitting there minding its own business and something comes along and stimulates it, maybe it's you tapping your funny bone, that's you hitting the neuron and causing depolarizations in the neuron, then what happens is this. Uh, a few small sodium channels start to open up, and when we get to, depending on which book you read, uh, around minus 80, around minus 70 millivolts, a whole bunch of sodium channels open up, all these other channels open up, and all the sodium which is outside the cell starts to rush in. Sodium, being positive, comes into the inside of the cell, makes the inside of the cell more positive, so the charge, the resting membrane potential, starts to go up and we get quite positive while the sodium channels are open. Then those sodium channels close and the potassium which is in the inside of the cell, starts to go through the now open potassium channels and we start kicking positive charges from the inside of the cell to the outside of the cell. And when we do that, where's my cursor? There it is. When we do that, we start to drop our resting membrane potential again. Of course, this has to reset. I'll talk about that in a few minutes. But that's the pattern of depolarization of a neuron. They go sodium, into the cell, making it positive, potassium out of the cell, bringing it back down the negative. And it happens very, very quickly. If I put time on the axis here, it's just milliseconds that this happens. So we get a very quick of transmission of, of the action potential down the neurons. That works well for neurons, but it doesn't work well for the heart. And let me tell you why. 
because in the heart we have basically chambers, big either atria or ventricles. And if we just do a quick little neuronal type zap, they'll just kind of quiver really quickly and then stop. And that's not what we want. We want them to be uh, electrified for a while. We want them to be stimulated for a while. So instead of just going, they go, Ur, and they squeeze. And when they squeeze, they squeeze all the blood out. So if we're just doing this, you know, sodium potassium transfer that neurons do in cardiac cells, we go, uh, 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 and the heart wouldn't actually squeeze, squeeze, squeeze. It would just sort of quiver and without cardiac output, we die. So that obviously wouldn't work for us because we'd be dead. So somehow we have to extend this area where the cell, the resting membrane potential is positive, where we've actually bumped up into the positive. And as it stays in the positive, that will make a longer period for the heart to be doing its and squishing the blood out. How can we extend it? Well, if you think back, the answer is kind of obvious because we've got sodium outside the cell, potassium inside the cell, but we've got another positive ion outside of the cell in the heart, and that's calcium. So what we're going to do is as the potassium starts running out, we're going to start pushing calcium in to counteract that. So yes, you've got positive potassium charges going out, but you've also got positive calcium charges going in and that extends the action potential and gives us this plateau because we're using our voltage gated channels for calcium to extend the plateau out. That's really important. And that's a big difference between neurons and um, uh, cardiac cells, particularly the ventricular cardiac cells, the ventricular myocytes, not the pacemakers. Okay, so there's a few terms that we tend to use and you need to be familiar with these terms, you need to know them. So the heart in its resting state down here is polarized. And when the sodium starts rushing in, it depolarizes, it goes above zero to what we call hyperpolarized. Then there's this plateau, it repolarizes and then comes back down into the polarized state where it normally rests. We use those terms, we also use some numbers. So we call these the different phases of depolarization. And the resting phase, let's start at the end. The resting phase is four, so that's where we're normally at. So that just rests until the next depolarization. We come back over here and we're in our resting phase and then we get our depolarization, hyperpolarization. The depolarization is zero, hyperpolarization is phase one. The plateau is phase two, repolarization is phase three, and then fully polarized again is back into phase four. So it's important that you know polarized, depolarized, hyperpolarized, plateau, repolarized, and polarized. It's also important that you know phase zero, phase one, phase two, phase three, phase four. You should be able to label these diagrams. So let's look at detail. I've sort of summarized it quickly. Let's go back and go a little bit slower through our spiral curriculum here and go a little bit deeper through it this time. So we're gonna describe the same thing only in more detail. And you'll see I've got my um, action potential um, diagram down here and I'm giving the phases using the numbers. I've also got another diagram up here. And this is a picture basically of the plasma membrane of the cell. So here's the membrane, the white in between. Extracellular is the pink, so this is all the stuff outside the cell. Intracellular is the blue, it's all the stuff inside the cell. So when we're resting in phase four here, nothing's really happening. Then we hit phase zero. And in phase zero, all the, not all, but a lot of the sodium, which is outside the cell, rushes in and it rushes in very quickly. That's why I've put three whole arrows, just to emphasize that a ton of sodium rushes in really quickly. And as that sodium rushes in, it starts to make our resting membrane potential positive until we come up to here at the end of phase zero. If you want a description of what's going on, we get a rapid influx of sodium through some of the sodium channels. That occurs until we hit around uh, 10 or 20 millivolts higher. And when we hit 10 or 20 millivolts higher, or less negative than the rest of the, the normal resting membrane potential, then all of our sodium channels open up. It diffuses into the, into the inside of the cell really quickly, and it keeps on going. It keeps on shooting in until we get to around plus 20 of the resting membrane potential. At that point, they close. 
And as our graph starts to come back down again, we have to get back to around minus 60, minus 70 before those sodium channels actually reset. If we don't get back down low enough, they don't reset and they can't open again. So if during this action potential, we don't get low enough, the action potential can't refire. So it's important that we get back down to negative so that our sodium channels can open up again for the next depolarization. That's phase zero. Now in phase one, the voltage gated sodium channels close. So there's no more sodium rushing into the cell. The sodium influx stops and we have some fast potassium channels open and we start getting potassium rushing from inside the cell, our intracellular potassium here, starting to rush outside. And of course that takes positive charges with it. So we start to become more negative on the inside of the cell. Then we hit phase two and this is our plateau. What happens here is the calcium continues to exit, um, but calcium starts I said potassium, right? I hope I said potassium. Potassium starts to exit. Calcium starts to rush into the cell and that extends our positive phase, it extends our above zero resting membrane potential for a little while. And that keeps us this nice plateau so we can get a good squeeze in the heart. And at this point, there's no sodium movement because sodium now is exhausted. The sodium channels went up to positive 20 and we haven't gone back, back down to minus 65 yet. So the sodium channels are out of the game. They have to recover. They can't come in until the next game. In phase three, those calcium channels that was pushing calcium in, they start to close, but the potassium is still going out and we start to drop down. And as we drop down, the sodium and the calcium channels can now reset and they're ready to open again in the next phase. In phase four, we've got something very interesting happening. This is our resting phase, but it's not static. The resting phase in the myocytes is actually a little dynamic because our cells want to keep us at around minus 90 for our resting membrane potential. They want to keep the insides of the cell around minus 90. Well, if we have too much potassium coming back into the cell, then that's going to alter our resting membrane potential. So we need to fix that. We need to rectify that if we put too much potassium into the cell by kicking some out to keep us at minus 90. And we have other channels called potassium rectifier channels, which rectify the resting membrane potential and keep it at around minus 90. And that is our resting state. We're almost done, but I'm sure you can see the problem. The problem now is that we've taken our sodium calcium from outside the cell and put it inside the cell, and we've taken our calcium, cal potassium from inside, I do this professionally. We take our potassium from inside the cell and push it outside the cell. And so we've done basically this. And the cell is still like this. We've taken our sodium and calcium, put them in, taken the potassium, taken it out, and now the cell's stuck like this. Somehow, we need to do this and kick our sodium and calcium back out and put our potassium back in. The way we do that is by what we were talking about before with the sodium-potassium pump, the calcium pump, and the sodium-calcium exchanger and the sodium-proton exchanger. So if we take a look, we have our sodium and, and calcium that went into the cell. They're now inside the cell. How do we get the sodium and calcium out? Sodium potassium pump kicks sodium out. The calcium ATP pump kicks calcium out. We had potassium that was inside the cell go outside the cell. It's out here now. How do we get the potassium back in? The sodium potassium pump kicks a bunch of calcium in. And as I said before, these pumps create a concentration gradient which drive these exchangers. So we can get a bit more calcium out, not just by this pump, but by this exchanger. That kicks the extra calcium out. Yeah, we put more sodium in, but we just kick more sodium out, which gives us more potassium in. And we've got hydrogen ions in here that we want to get rid of, so we exchange it with a sodium. The sodium again goes up, gets kicked out, and we get even more potassium in. So there's only one potassium channel, but because we keep kicking a lot of sodium out, we actually managed to get a lot of potassium in. So that's how our cells depolarize. That's how the ions go from sodium and calcium on the outside, potassium on the inside, to switch, 
through the voltage gated channels because they want to go in this direction. And then we have to drag them back out manually using ATP and those ion exchangers to get things back to where they need to go. And then we're polarized again, ready to fire off. So this is a really important concept to understand. And you should be able to reproduce this diagram on a blank piece of paper. And when you write this in, make sure you write in uh, polarized, depolarization, repolarization, plateau, all that sort of stuff, okay? So make sure you understand this. Now, this is a really important concept. And when I present things, sometimes my style of presenting works, sometimes it doesn't. I used to teach at Flinders University and there was another lecturer there named Tim. And Tim was like almost the opposite type of lecturer that I was. And we found that he was a great lecturer, but he just taught really differently than I did. And I think I'm an okay lecturer. I was just different than Tim. So what we found is this bimodal distribution in the students that some of the students really loved Tim and some of the students really loved Mark, but it was rare to find somebody who liked us both because it's just a matter of style. So if my style in this particular lecture didn't work for you, you'll be happy to know there are alternatives. If you um, Google action potential on YouTube, you get a flood of videos. The one I really like is this particular one and the address is down there at the bottom, the URL. And what I kind of like, which is neat, is they talk about the resting membrane potential as a battery. And when they talk about sodium, they use salt as a demonstration. When they talk about calcium, they use your bones. And when they talk about potassium, they use a banana. And they actually show this is animated with the salt and the calcium and the potassium flowing in between the inside of the cell and the outside of the cell. And it gives you a running resting membrane potential. So if you just watched what I did and said, I don't really understand what you're talking about, give this one a try. It's only about four minutes, so it's a bit quicker than mine. And it's, it's a really good lecture as well. Now, the other thing I'd like to recommend for you is an entire channel, and it's called Khan Academy. And if you've never heard of Khan Academy, where have you been? But if you've never heard of it, I've just introduced you to your new best friend for studying because Khan Academy has a ton of material. And whenever I want to review or learn something new in basic sciences or math, I go to Khan Academy because it's a great, great presentation. And within Khan Academy, they have a whole section called Advanced Circulatory System Physiology. And I've just shown the top of the page here, but there's actually quite a few lectures and they get into um, you know, depolarization and the action potential and excitation contraction coupling, which we'll cover soon. So there's all sorts of information. And I would honestly say that if you're studying to be a paramedic, you should review all the lectures in the Advanced Circulatory System Physiology module. It's really, really good and it's incredibly essential information presented quite well. So that's it. That's the action potential. That's how we make heart uh, cells depolarize and we'll talk about how that depolarization turns into squeezing, but that's how we get the lub dub going. If you've got any questions, feel free to email me or leave them in the comments and I look forward to hearing from you. See you at the next lecture.